Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be here with you on such a beautiful Sunday morning, and it really does feel like summer's just around the corner, doesn't it? We're starting a new series in Galatians this week, uh, and that's actually going to take us right up to the middle of December. And before we dig into our text for today, I want to give you a quick outline of where we're going to go over the next nine weeks. Now, Galatians is a wonderful book. It's a book that reminds us of our standing before God as a community and urging us to live in unity as God has designed us to do. So a bit of background to set up our series. The letter to the Galatians was written by the Apostle Paul to the churches in Galatia, which he planted himself. Now here's a map. Galatia is that red section. Paul comes through Galatia in Acts chapter 16 and 18, preaching the gospel, which he has received from God himself. But the book begins a little bit differently to most of Paul's letters. A normal beginning from Paul would begin with him introducing himself, I, Apostle Paul, writing you this letter in the grace of God, And then a section of thanksgiving to the church that he's writing to. Not so the Galatian church. Paul writes, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. These are not normal beginnings for a letter from Paul. But it speaks to the urgency with which he writes this letter to address a very serious issue. And for Paul, this is very personal. He was the one who preached the gospel to them initially. They have now decided that what Paul said was incorrect. Now, one of the main themes that we're going to come back to in the next few weeks is the title of our series, All One in Christ Jesus. This speaks to our belonging as a church. As Christians, we are united in faith in Christ Jesus. There is no Jew or Gentile, no slave or free, no difference between male or female or North Shore and Western suburbs. We all come together and we are all the same. We belong to one community, a family of believers. Well, that's where we're going to go over the next few months. I do hope that you'll walk with us as we go through this letter. So now we have a bit of understanding as to where we're going. Let's look at our passage for today. In chapter 1, Paul does two main things. Firstly, he confirms his calling is from God and tells the Galatian church of God's gospel revealed to him. And secondly, he rebukes the Galatians for listening to a gospel other than the one that he preached to them. And so let's look at that first point. Let's look at how Paul confirms his calling is from God. And before we look at the passage, it's worth remembering that being an evangelist was not Paul's dream job. He had absolutely no intention of being someone who went to the Gentiles, of all people, to tell them the good news about Jesus Christ. Paul reminds the Galatians in verses 13 and 14 of just how much of a Jew he was. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Now we know that Paul was one of the men who led the charge in persecuting the early church and even killing some of the early Christians for blasphemy before his own conversion in Acts chapter 9. And so Paul's calling couldn't be from men. 
He was so heavily invested in what he thought was the truth that it would take an act of God to change his heart. And that's exactly what God did. God revealed himself through Jesus to Paul on the road to Damascus. And so we see Paul talk of his calling from God in verses 1 to 5 and also from 11 to the end of the chapter. He shows it is from God and not man, even from the very first verse. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men, nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now, why is this important? Well, it is in contrast to the false teachers that have infiltrated the Galatian church. They have been sent by men. But Paul has been sent by Jesus himself. And we see that in Acts chapter 13. And this is a wonderful little passage if you've never seen it before. Listen to this. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting... The Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. Just put yourself in the room for a moment. Here you are, Worshipping God and fasting with these men. When the Holy Spirit speaks. Have you ever noticed this before? God is setting aside Paul and Barnabas for works to be done. And those works are to continue their ministry to the Gentile regions outside of Israel. So Paul is very much sent by God and not men. And he shows us in 11 to 24 his experience of sharing the gospel that also did not originate from men. And we're not going to walk through this section verse by verse, but these verses here are key to understanding the whole book, to understanding why Paul speaks with such authority to the Galatians. He writes, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. The authority that Paul has comes from God. He gave him this gospel personally by revelation. He has been sent to preach this gospel to the Gentiles. And none of this is for Paul's personal gain. If anything, Paul's life got significantly more difficult after his conversion. But the gospel he preached comes directly from God. He heard it from Jesus' lips. And so his preaching and his writing carries the same weight as someone sent directly from God. Much in the same way the prophets did in the Old Testament, Paul's words carry enormous weight which makes his rebuke against the Galatians that much more forceful. We find in verses 6 to 10 this rebuke that the Galatians have turned away from the true gospel of God, the gospel that Paul preached to them, the one that Jesus himself gave to Paul. And they've turned from that to something else. And any other, anything other than the true gospel of God is... No gospel at all. And Paul takes this personally. He can't believe that they have turned from what he taught them. Hear the weight in his words. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. 
Now, this is a theme that we're going to come back to later in the letter, as Paul doesn't address any issue in particular just yet. We don't have the details of what the gospel is that they've turned to. But what we do see here is the consequence for those who preach this other gospel. Paul goes on. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Now, these are strong words. And being under God's curse is something that we should all avoid. God's curse ends with eternal punishment in hell. It is not something to be toyed with. Any distortion of the gospel leads in this direction. And this applies to the Galatians too. If they have left behind the gospel that Paul preached and now believe this other gospel and then they teach this other gospel to other people who don't know any better, they too will be under God's curse. Now Paul finishes this section by reminding the Galatians of his motivation for not only preaching the gospel to them, but now also for this rebuke. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of God. He is not doing this for his own glory. He doesn't want to be seen as a man of wisdom or to have power and control over the Galatians. He's doing it to serve Christ, to follow the instructions he has been given by God. And the Galatians need to hear these words, to be brought back to the truth. And so Paul's willing to put himself out there to help them see what they need to come back to. So what, have, what does all of this mean for us today? Well, we don't have the same problems that the Galatian church did, and we'll see those problems in the next few weeks. But we do have the same gospel. Now, we can't pick and choose which parts of it we want to follow or believe. The gospel is the gospel, and the gospel will always be the gospel. But how do we know that this is the gospel, the true gospel, that was revealed by God. Well, that's what we read at the beginning of John's gospel. We read this earlier. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Out of God's fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Jesus has made God known to us. And we know God in a way that Israel of the Old Testament never did because of Jesus' revelation. And the gospel that we have heard through Scripture is the same gospel that Paul preached to the Galatians amongst many of the other churches that he planted. That gospel has not changed so when we talk about being a church that believes in the gospel, we need to make sure that we know what it is that we're talking about. So when you are asked to define the gospel, what would you say? Well, over the centuries, there have been a few really good examples of the gospel being summarised into one statement. 
And we like having these summary statements because in them we have the simple truths about God and the gospel. And we can remember them, we can recite them. Now we know the Apostles' Creed was written around the 4th century. It's an excellent summary of a statement of beliefs that we hold to be true about our triune God. In much the same way, the Nicene Creed that we said earlier works in the same way. It's just a bit more detailed. But since then, we've seen other versions that attempt to distill the true gospel into short statements. And without getting into the weeds of the Reformation in the 16th century, this is how they would describe the gospel from the perspective of how we are saved. The Reformers would say, Christians are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, revealed as revealed by Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. Now, for us today, we might need something that's a little more up for our culture and time. So let's try this statement on for size. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for our sins and rose again, eternally triumphant over his enemies, so that there is now no condemnation for those who believe, but only everlasting joy. That's the gospel. And this all comes from God and not men. There is nothing in it that should bring us any glory, only glory to God. And any time you hear someone say to you that what you do is part of how you are saved, please know that is a lie. We need to make sure that we know the true gospel. We want to come together as a community of believers and rejoice in the fact that we all, know, we all know this gospel comes from God. It is the thing that unites us. And we accept the differences that we have in our church community and we love each other regardless. I mean, the joy of being the church is that we walk alongside people who are vastly different from ourselves, but who share that same belief in the true gospel of God. And we don't need to look very far to find people that are quite different from ourselves. We sit alongside them each and every week. Our church has an age range of zero to 99. Isn't that wonderful? Zero to 99. But we are one body. We haven't always shown that we are one body nearly as well as we could. But we will. Our belonging to our church community is based on this gospel, which means that we will purposefully be working to come together as a whole church community, to be building relationships outside of our services and to be a beacon to the community that live around us. There is space for everyone in our church, no matter how different they are from us. To finish up, Paul is quite clear in stating how he received the good news about Jesus' death and resurrection. It was through revelation from God. And while you and I did not have the same conversion experience on the road to Damascus as Paul did, what we know of God, what we know of Jesus and the Holy Spirit also comes to us through revelation. God reveals himself to us in his word. Jesus shows us God the Father through his life, death and resurrection. And we see through this revelation how we can come to be in a relationship with God. Now this is going to come into stronger focus as we move through the letter of Galatians. As Paul gives clarity around the issues that the church are dealing with. And we're going to see how God is going to help the Galatians come back to the true gospel of God. But for us, perhaps this is a time 
when we look at our own lives and see if we are following the true gospel as given by God, revealed to us by Jesus? Do we truly believe that Jesus' death and resurrection not only saves us from condemnation, but brings us to an eternity with him? Do we know that it has nothing to do with us? That we can't do anything to help save ourselves? We can only place our faith in God and trust that he will remain faithful to his promises. As we move through Galatians, I pray that you'll gain some clarity on this, if this is an issue for you. And I pray that you will find joy in this true gospel, a sure hope of our eternal home with God. But that's all to come in the next few months. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And through it, you reveal yourself to us so that we can know all the things that you have done for us. We thank you for Jesus, for his death and resurrection, and for making us right with you again. Lord, help us to hold firm to this gospel. Hold firm to your love for us and resist the temptations that the world will put in front of us. Let us know you more deeply as we continue to put all our faith in you and your promises to us. I pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.